Thanks for joining this morning. Uh, my name is Steve Jordan. I'm a senior innovation consultant at Bright Idea. I work on the professional services team. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about some customer success stories on how you can launch an innovation program effectively. Um, we've got four great panelists, so I'm happy to be, be here. They're the stars of the show today. I'm going to be trying to moderate and stay out of the way as best I can. Um, we've got about an hour together today. Um, but I think we're going to have a really good discussion. This is going to be a free-flowing discussion, so I do have some slides because what we're covering is a really meaty topic, right? It's hard to cover how do you successfully launch an innovation program in an hour. So we're just going to be talking about um, some, some lessons learned, uh, some success stories, and I've just got some slides to try to keep us on track so that we make sure we cover, cover everything here. So what we're going to be doing today is <coughs> after some introductions and le letting you meet the panelists, we're really going to talk about four main to topics. The first is going to be the catalyst, so, so the why, are, why are we here, why are we going to do an innovation program. Once we do that, <coughs> we want to talk about the team and approach that people used. Um, so there's a lot of different ways, and team can be a lot of things to a lot of people. It can be really small or really big. I want to talk through some, some stories about <coughs> the program launch, the first launch, and then how you roll out and keep momentum. And then something that you, you heard a lot yesterday that we're obviously really interested in here at Bright Ideas, talking about tracking impact, right? How do we measure, and then how do we use that to look forward into year two and beyond? We're going to have Q&A um, from you guys at the end of each section. Um, I'll be keeping us on time, but then we'll have some time at the end if there are topics that maybe don't fall into this or that came up during the discussion. Sound good? OK, cool. So we've got four great panelists today. I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. So first up, we have Michael. I'm Michael. <laughs> um, I work for TD Ameritrade. Uh, we're a fairly new team, the Enterprise Innovation Team, uh, but I've been with TDA for 13 years. Um, I was an operations manager, project manager, most recently a lean uh, coach and manager uh, before moving into this role. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about it kind of what our structure is like as a team, but um, that's, that's what we're doing. Great, thanks. And Brooke? Oh, so we are in order. That was order. <laughs> um, so I'm Brooke Codney. I'm with the American Heart Association, um, also relatively new in the innovation space. Um, uh, we created my role two and a half years ago, um, but I've been with the American Heart Association for 10 years. Um, and so I, I am a team of one, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but i um, really excited to be here today. Awesome. I'm Derek Paul. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is gone from last night. <coughs> I'm with Unisys, and I'm the old guy in the room. I've been with the company for 40 years <laughs> uh, in a variety of roles, um, both here and abroad. And I've been working in the innovation space probably for the last uh, about three years uh, with uh, with the program that we now run. So, great. I'm Katie Milbeck. I'm with Brady Corporation out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've been with Brady for 16 years in various engineering roles throughout my career, and most recently taking on the role of the innovation manager at, um, at Brady, obviously, um, in about April. Great. And one of the things that's in interesting for me in talking to you guys, I've worked with a couple of you on services engagements, but um, to very different focuses for your innovation team, right? From uh, How do we become a better fundraising innovation uh, organization to engineering, high tech, so, so really cool. I think we're gonna hear a lot about that today. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we wanted to kind of center this around as well as you saw this journey yesterday um, in a couple of the presentations, we're really gonna be talking about getting started. So a lot of what we'll be discussing today is probably close, most closely rated f uh, related to BI programs. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the types of activities you're going to hear about uh, were primarily around using those apps and using those approaches as you, you build out your team. So just to give you a sense of where we are, we'd love to, to grow all the way up the, uh, the journey ladder to, to company-wide um, change. But right now we're talking about how do, we, how do we get started. And hopefully people in the room are either um, thinking about getting started sort of just early on in their journey. And some of the lessons that we'll hear about today will be, be really useful. So again, here's what we're going to be talking about. And so and one of the nice things about <coughs> being a consultant here at Bright Idea is when we get started with people, we get to ask the first question, like, why are you here? What was the, what was the 
catalyst behind why you're working with, with Bright Idea, right? And everybody's story is oftentimes different. So there's top-down mandates, there's bottom-up viral, you know, people in a garage, like we heard from, from GM yesterday, and then some combination of both of, both of them. So um, I thought your story was really cool um, with AHA in terms of how this, this came um, from the top down, mm -hmm. and it was formally structured. Can you talk a little bit about um, how your group got started? Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, so you can see our, our 2020 impact goal there, you know, as a nonprofit organization. Um, we're very mission aligned and focused and so each each decade we set a, um, a decade long goal and so in um, 2010 actually we had achieved our previous decade goal a little bit early so we we're very excited to set our, our 2020 impact goal so you can see there you know by 2020 to improve cardiovascular health of all Americans by 20 percent while at the um, same time reducing deaths from cardiovascular disease and stroke by 20 percent that's a really big goal um, and it and it takes a lot of different pieces in order for us you know to reach those those types of goals but also has an, an incredible impact on um, you know just the overall health of Americans and so um, in order to achieve these goals we have a pretty um, in-depth strategic planning process uh, that ha goes everything from you know the mission side to how we're going to raise the money to actually fund the research and the programs that will drive us towards um, these type of goals. And so part of our strategic planning process, which we do every three years, uh, is to look at the revenue generation side specifically. And when we uh, you know, looked at what, in order to reach those 2020 goals, what do we need to do? And that was, as you can see here, to become a billion dollar organization. And so you have just a little bit of trend here to show you um, sort of where we were coming from when we were in that strategic planning process. And so it was in between the 12, 13, and 16, 17 fiscal years that um, this, you call it a mandate, um, but this idea of creating an innovation position was part of the strategic planning process. So uh, that's, uh, put together by a group of our executives, including our CEO, uh, as well as volunteers from across uh, many different uh, business lines. So we're really lucky as an organization that we can tap into talent. So the mandate was create an innovation role that specifically focuses on the revenue generation side of the business to help us really get to that billion dollar mark. At the time, I was in a much different role within the organization, though I was on a revenue generation side. And uh, you know, when they created the innovation role, it was a pretty blank space, basically, help us get to a billion dollars, uh, which, was, which was very exciting, um, but really allowed me to come in and uh, think about what are the different ways that we can really drive the revenue um, and to do it quickly because 2020 is looming and um, we, there are lives to save and the work that we do today really does help us get there. And so as I mentioned before, um, two and a half years uh, ago is when I started in the role and I am a mighty team of one um, and focused on you know really driving the revenue both from within the business, current business lines where we are already raising funds while also um, you know, bringing new revenue generation ideas. And that's where Bright Idea really helps us actually in, in both of those um, buckets. So um, we leverage Bright Idea to help us, you know, identify ways to raise money better in the ways that we're already doing it, as well as to think about what, how could we be raising money tomorrow um, and engaging individuals tomorrow that looks different from how um, we're really looking at things today. Does that help? Cool. Really, it, so it's an interesting story, right? And some people don't have a, hey, we're going to do this as part of a strategic plan, then we're going to create a role, it's going to have this mission, and then oh, we're going to put you in there. I think we're going to hear, there's some other stories fr from you guys in, in a minute about how you sort of created the roles out of nowhere and made, convinced them that they needed it. But um, I worked actually with, with TDA um, early on. I th we, you had a similar sort of top-down quote unquote mandate in terms of what you, you needed to do. I think when we went and did a workshop for two or three days with you guys, brought people mm -hmm. from all over the country, all over the world in, and it was, we jokingly called it group therapy because we had all these innovation <laughs> folks. So do you want to talk a little bit about your, your group's um, 
mandate? Yeah, uh, the therapy didn't stick. We hate each other. <laughs> um, so, no, that's not true at all. Uh, ours is kind of an interesting journey in that uh, probably six years ago or so, and I mentioned I was a lean manager before this role, a lean coach, uh, we started on a lean transformation. And um, we really did that heavily in our um, retail, in our operations department, in our uh, kind of frontline institutional department. And we tried it in technology, and it didn't work terribly well there. And as we kind of refocus and step back, realize, well, that's because we probably should be looking at more of an agile transformation and uh, kind of do lean for tech, because uh, there's, there's so much crossover there. Uh, they grew out of the same roots. And so for the past two years, we've been on a lean transformation, or I'm sorry, an agile transformation in our delivery uh, technology groups. And um, as we came, uh, let's say about a year ago, uh, we have a new CEO who's, who'd come on about a year and a half ago. And uh, he came in and, and he really was interested in refocusing TD Ameritrade back to some of our disruptive roots. So if you go back to the, the 70s and, and earlier, no, or not, not earlier, we didn't exist earlier, <laughs> but around that time and, and on, I remember when I got hired at TD Ameritrade my first day, one of the trainers said, yeah, we were the first to do uh, phone <laughs> trades. Uh, we were not the first to do online trades, but we bought that company, so we're the first to do online <laughs> trades. Uh, and, and so there's this kind of history um, of things that did as the industry was deregulated, we, um, as, as commissions specifically were deregulated, we, we pushed into areas that the industry hadn't gone. So there was this, des there's this desire to get back to those disruptive roots and how can we not just take this continuous improvement stuff that we've been doing for a long time, but use those skills, use those mindsets that are so common, or not, uh, that, that are in common with the more disruptive, innovative mindset and start moving beyond incremental improvement to actual leapfrog kinds of improvements. And so when the CEO says things like that, everybody goes ah, and they run and we have what we lovingly call innovation anarchy at TD Ameritrade right now. <laughs> and um, we are in the midst of kind of that uh, diverge and converge kind of um, cycle of lots of people getting super excited about it, trying lots of different things, and now we're um, learning from each other, trying to come back together, but continue to use those unique things that we do. And uh, my team is um, about six months old, mm -hmm. so we are fairly new. My boss uh, was probably three months before that. <laughs> um, and uh, Melanie, who's with us, uh, or who's, who's here today uh, and yesterday, uh, she joined a couple months ago as well. And so we are a team of five, um, but we have these other kind of pockets of very focused type innovation that our purview is more, how do we draw all of that together into one unified strategy and program and really focus on the culture change, the, uh, as, as cliche as it may sound, the hearts and minds kind of aspect of things. Um, we're not the ones that are necessarily going out and experimenting with AI and trying to bring in AR and trying to do, but we're more interested in how do we engage the entire workforce in this mindset and build on, it's, it's here too, so I gestured incorrectly, <laughs> uh, build on this lean and agile foundation and engine that we have that people are really engaged with to then start layering on this new level of thinking. Uh, take those skill sets, take that mindset, take that focus, and start looking at bigger things. Very cool. And so very much uh, you guys go take this. You have a mandate to go figure that out. Don't yeah. stop the other innovation that's happening. But, right. But we need to put some structure around this. You guys have a little bit of a different uh, quote unquote mandate where you want to talk about your, your story of uh, how you convince people that they should put you in this full-time role? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, my, I got the full-time role back in April, but it started a bit earlier than that, uh, about January of 2016, 17? Anyways, two years ago, roughly. Um, it was brought to me that we were looking <clears throat> to start an innovation challenge at our company, and there really wasn't any structure behind it. We had Scott, who uh, joined us as a consultant, who helped us out in the program, but really a blank sheet of paper to do what we wanted to do with the program. So as a team of one, um, brought volunteers on, we launched our program. We really scoped our program as something of new products and services for our organization. It was really 
for year one, we wanted to be revenue generating ideas. So I'll talk about in a little bit about the yeah. benefits of our program, but that's kind of how we got started. So you had a hundred, hundred people volunteer network, you showed value and then said, Hey, wouldn't it be great if I can do this full time? Exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was great to be able to dip our toes in the water a bit, see the success as we were going through the year before it became a full time role. I'll be honest, even when I got the um, role to start out with as a volunteer job, I wasn't 100% convinced that this process would work. Mm -hmm. And so I had to convince myself as well that we were that this was something of value to the organization. So when I was able to see that and then pitch the role, it was I my heart and soul was behind it because I was so excited and I really believed in it. Great. And Derek, I know you talked about your uh, similar approach yesterday. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. On the yeah. bigger stage. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks the, for uh, joining us down here. Oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I've been demoted. Yeah, yeah, you've been demoted, yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, we, uh, I, I work in the technology part of Unisys have all my life, and uh, you know, innovation is the lifeblood of a technology company, so we really have to be doing stuff. And that was, <clears throat> was always going on in the product groups uh, kind of thing, but we recognized you know, a couple of years ago, we really need to pull this together and have a more formal approach to doing innovation if we want to get the results we're looking for. So, you know, a couple of years ago, they, they, th they thought, well, let's do something here, and kind of, it was Brittany and got started in it about a year later. I was helping on the side, you know, she was in the East Coast, I was in the West Coast. Uh, I was kind of helping on the side, but then about two years ago or so, they, they brought it all together mm -hmm. uh, as one, and we're now all focused on, on doing that. But it's very much about you know, what I was always trying to do was create the culture of innovation, get it away from being a one-time event. Mm -hmm. You know, we're having a campaign, do this now. Mm -hmm. It's more about people need to think about this on an ongoing basis, day in, day out, mm -hmm. and get away from the top-down driven approach, so. Yeah. Less something you do, more the way you do what you yes. do. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for folks in the audience, how many of you would say you have a mandate? Somebody's created your team and said, I'm gonna, okay about maybe 40%. And then how many people are sort of skunk working this thing? <laughs> Don't want to admit it, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Any questions uh, about Catalyst or from that discussion? Got a few minutes. We can save them for the end as well, but. And I should say, when I say lovingly call it innovation anarchy, it's actually not really a bad thing because we're learning so much from trying so many different things that it's super exciting. Um, it could be a bad thing if our partners and the other people weren't willing to work together, <laughs> but they are. And so we, we really learned a ton from each other as we try all these different things. And I think the company I come from, um, we innovate all the time, right? That's why we're still in business after 100, 150 years is because we've been able to develop products and bring new things to market. So could you talk a little bit about that transition of what's different now? How do you convince your organization that the way that you've historically innovated um, needs to shift or change? And how do you create that, that fire, that burning platform for people to say, yeah, we need to start doing this differently? We tell them. <laughs> I have no issue with that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I can I can share. We're you know the we've always been a very innovative organization and definitely encouraged innovation at you know the very grassroots level, but um, we weren't seeing the type of innovation we needed to really have breakthrough new ideas. It was a lot of improvement upon how we're doing things, or something would be tried in one market and. No one even know that it was tried in that market. So we weren't able to scale. And then on the other hand, when innovation was driven sort of from the top down, we didn't have a formalized approach to how we did it or why we did it. We just sort of were like, that's a great idea. Let's try it. And um, things were failing because we weren't really thinking about what we needed to do. So we had sort of these two ways that innovation were happening, though they were definitely woven into the culture, um, you know, the fabric of the culture. But having somebody to really specifically look at innovation, the idea behind it is that to put some process around it, we weren't tracking anything either. It was all, you know, a lot of grassroots. So we weren't tracking anything and we weren't identifying what are those best ideas. The other thing we weren't doing was looking externally 
to help feed our innovation. It was all very sort of innovation that was happening within the bubble of our organization. And so the biggest difference was if we want to see the exponential growth that we needed to see as an organization, there needed to be some dedicated resources. Otherwise, it was going to be sort of little incremental growth that happened throughout from our experience. That was a better answer. <laughs> we did, yeah. Well, we did have. We do have to still tell them what we need. Though. That's still part of it. Although I would say I think ours echoes very much that same that same journey and realizing that um, though we'd had a, a very strong history of innovation, um, there was some real need to reinvigorate how high we were aiming, mm -hmm. and that freedom to fail fast, that freedom to look at something not working out as a learning opportunity and a really, really good thing um, and, and just kind of pull back to those roots. Um, I think that was more, more of our focus, reinvigorating. I think as well from our perspective, you know, over the years because we were technology led in doing some of the stuff, we produced some great shelfware mm. that never ended up anywhere. Mm. So there was the realization that, you know, engineers developing something in and of itself is not a complete solution. You need to have the business involved mm -hmm. in doing things like that. And as part of what we're doing now, we have integrated it with the business units in the company, so there's a better chance when we've done something that there's actually a market for it, as distinct from some really cute technology sitting on a shelf somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, Great. And um, if we don't get to some of the questions, this is going to spill out into the hallway. You can find these guys and ask questions <coughs> as well. Um, and we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. So just to keep us on track, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about, I put team in quotes here because that implies plural or something <laughs> formal. Um, and that's not always the case when it comes to, to corporate innovation. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit about, now that you've got this mandate, one of the biggest questions people ask, and I never can really answer it, is how big should an innovation team be? But I don't know if you're asking this or seeing people ask it in, in the hallway, well, how big's your company? Oh, it's a billion and a half. How many people do you have? My experience, there's some times where people are 40, 40 person teams at a smaller company and one person. When I, when I launched an innovation program at a, a large pharma, it was me basically and two part timers for 117,000 people. Um, weren't as effective as we could, could have been because we weren't staffed appropriately and we made a case and grew over time. But um, so I wanted to, you guys have uh, different uh, approaches, different structures here. So um, I wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about, um, M Michael, your journey when mm -hmm. you had, I think one of the eye charts you showed me had like 43 different innovation initiatives going on with handoffs. And they said, you guys, can you, you know, don't stop the good stuff, but can you put some structure and, and the, the Wild West and the anarchy? How did you guys go about sizing your team, building your team? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, um, one thing that we're really lucky in, if you want to just bring it all up, because it actually goes yeah. bottom up. I don't know why we did the animation in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we, we are lucky in is um, we've, through our lean and agile transformation, we started adding in these groups to, to experiment and to try. We have a group that we call advanced technology that is experimenting with how can we pull in disruptive or new technologies and make them a part of TD Ameritrade, um, things like AI, things like AR, VR, the, the big ones that we've talked about, right? Uh, blockchain and so on. Um, but we needed to continue to build the engine that all that sits on. And so the real focus for the last five to six years has been that engine and that lean and agile transformation and um, getting better at the things that we have to do to keep the lights on, right? Um, and do those things faster, speed up the metabolism, speed up the delivery, speed up um, and, 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 and integrate our business and our technology groups together so they're actually talking <laughs> to each other, um, having a relationship as well as maybe talk to a customer every once in a while, uh, get, a, get a feel for what they really actually want. That seems like a good idea. Um, so what's interesting in that is then we have this kind of middle layer um, and all these things started before my team came into existence and they, they're very focused on some point solutions, or not point solutions, but in some specific areas. So we have a, you know, a ventures type team or a, um, a startup studio type team that's exploring new business opportunities. Um, you know, maybe these are some things we could look at placing some small bets on to have potential big directions to go and experiment with those. Um, we have a group, I mentioned the, the advanced tech team that is exploring 
new technologies and how could we maybe try something with blockchain in our in our organization or try so even if it's just internally um, how could we try something learn how to use these technologies we have a group that's focusing on partnerships so uh, we were part of the first 10 companies to um, do the Apple business chat um, uh, partner with them on that exploration uh, we've got you know uh, a chat bot on Facebook that clients can talk with and get information about their accounts and once it reaches the end of its intelligence connect them with a <laughs> connect them with a person um, you know we've we've tried to explore some of those things in partnerships and so that team is 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 really running fast but all those things are fairly focused and you can't engage all 10,000 people in those things and so our team was created to say okay we've got some really good focused things going that are exploring some big big opportunities, but how do we continue to feed the talent into those areas, feed the ideas into those areas, and engage the entire organization? So why we picked five, it's probably the headcount we could get, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> um, uh, as, as far as uh, what, what that team looks like, um, what my team looks like. But you were, you were fairly intentional with the roles, right? Absolutely. So this role was very much created with that intent of that cultural change and that real focus on bringing a system, managing Bright Idea to help enable that cultural system and build upon all the successes that we already have, partner with our lean leaders and our agile leaders and our learning and development folks, partner with all these people to pull this together. Um, certainly don't try to do it all ourselves because if there's, well, you don't want me teaching. Uh, you don't want me uh, doing, it. there's a lot of things we should utilize those, those um, those resources we have as a company and uh, pull those all together. And so that's really where, um, from a sizing of our team, we're fairly small because we're trying to, I say we're small. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, because we're, we are utilizing all those other folks and building those partnerships and, and, and those deep relationships to help kind of move the, the dial forward. And so Gina and your team, you're, you're definitely what we would call like a shared service. Innovation is a, a shared service to mm -hmm. the business. The other the other groups, um, startup like studio, labs. they're, they're, they're yeah. sort of contained. They're providing a service to the corporation mm -hmm. to go take those big bets, but you're entirely employee facing. Yeah. Uh, and, and also enabling departments across the company. Yes. Cool. Um, in terms of the approaches that the other folks in the panel are taking, are you all service? Would you say you're providing services? Um, you all have smaller teams, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a team of one, but um, I also consider myself a team of 100, too. We had many, many people volunteer in our first year when we launched our challenge from reviewing ideas to uh, coaching teams on presentations, being mentors to teams. So it really took a whole host of people with different backgrounds from our organization to help support the process in year one. Now that we're in year two and developing the ideas, um, the same applies except for we have dedicated dedicated technology resource to the teams, but still they're not full-time employees of the Innovation Incubator. That was done intentionally for a couple of reasons. First of all, we've got a really broad base of technology areas that we're covering, and we want to keep that fail fast mentality. So I don't want to be in the business of hiring and firing people. The other piece of this is that we already have resources in the organization that are extremely talented that can support these programs. And by bringing them into these programs and helping out with them, they're getting that innovative spirit and when they go back to the, their normal day jobs, uh, they can actually take that spirit back out into the organization and help drive the innovation initiatives throughout the organization. And you guys both are also doing capability building, right? So right. you can have a big impact because you can run lots of challenges um, across the whole company, get lots of ideas. But I see here you've got a kickbox initiative yep. to kind of teach design thinking and prototyping. You've yep. done some lean startup type um, you know, fail fast prototyping work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And similarly, one thing that's really cool is our, our innovation sprints created coaches for our kickbox challenge that came after it. So um, we've done the same thing with trying to utilize all these other folks who have tons of passion around this and they just want to stay engaged. They really want to be a part of it. And I think that's one of the really, the really powerful things of the draw of this work is it's super exciting to people. Mm -hmm. And they really want to, the, uh, <laughs> we're asking them to give up a ton of time and they 
do it without even thinking, which may be a problem with their bosses, but <laughs> we're thrilled. Um, you know, and, and that, that excitement that they have, that passion that they have to be involved and help somebody else learn what they've learned is just massive. One thing that we did in our organization, too, with the volunteers that I think was really powerful is we actually contacted their managers, too, to let them know that they'd be volunteering and got that agreement. So they essentially were given permission to work on the initiative, which is really important. You don't want people to have to hide this or feel like they're trying to make a decision between their day job and this. You want to empower people to be able to participate and have their bosses on board and give them that permission. Absolutely. Folks in the audience, who, who has a, a, a team that's bigger than five that's running innovation? Three, four, okay. And everybody else, an army of one? A lot of people who are armies of one. And you're early in the journey and trying to show value and then maybe it can grow? Great. Interesting. I, I mean, I think though what you were saying is very common. I mean, we have three or, or four, depending how you count full time working on it, but we have innovation coaches, we have innovation site leaders and things like that who are volunteering uh, to do it. So, you know, the real team is a lot larger than, you know, the small number. Yeah. And, yep. you know, these people are happy to participate and are really helpful. It just always amazes me. It shouldn't since I told my story about being one person at a, you know, 117,000. Um, it just amazes me how small innovation teams are and what a huge outsized impact they can have. So that's something that when we, uh, on the services team, we start working with people, one of the things you have to do is help build belief that yes, with one person or three people, you can actually, at the end of this year, show impact. Mm -hmm. You can touch thousands and thousands of people. That's kind of the, the power that you have as an army of one or as a small team. Um, and you can worry about growing and getting funding for prototyping and those types of things later. Does anybody in the audience, just a, a quick question, and I'll ask the panel, have uh, funded, if, if ideas come in, can you fund those yourself? No, mo a few people? Okay, yeah, about almost half. Okay, interesting. I think three or four years ago, we probably see one hand or two hands come up. It's something that we're starting to see more and more now that even early on, some teams are, are given that prototyping budget too. And you, do you have funding to do prototyping or to, to incubate ideas that come through? Yes, we definitely do. So we actually built it into our fiscal budgeting. The nice part about our, our organization is we've got the top-down support of this initiative. So with that budget, we also have leaders who don't want to worry about slicing and dicing things between cost centers. It's just spend the money let us know what you're spending and move forward and push ahead, which is really empowering because then you're not worried about the dollars and cents down to the nickel of what you're spending. You really can push things forward, obviously with accountability for what you're spending. It's not like I have an open checkbook, but it really is that empowered budget. Yeah, I mean, we're the same in the sense that the challenges we do with our, our verticals, that's one of the attractions is, you know, they'll collect a bunch of ideas, they will rate them, get it down to a couple, and then we will fund doing the proof of concept for it. So typically we'll fund about three months of work on it to produce some kind of demonstration proof of concept. Then if they want to go forward with it, it's up to them to take okay. it forward using their budget, but we do the initial work. So we're a nonprofit organization, <laughs> so we don't. Uh, so we did have some money when um, we originally started to help kickstart some of the ideas, and so we had an in innovation incubator fund. Not a lot of money, but a little bit of money that allowed us to, you know, really empower people to go out and try their ideas. We've recently moved to a new budgeting model where each business line is asked to actually budget for innovation ahead of time. So this will be new for us this year. We just we just started this a couple of months ago. Um, um, you know, we had to put forward the innovation projects we knew we needed to have funded this year, which is hard with <laughs> innovation. You're sort of making it up a little bit or padding some things so that you can, you know, know that you'll be able to have some money um, there. But it used to be sort of the pot where you could go off and fund and now in even more of an effort to encourage innovation throughout the company, it's it's become a mandate that each business line sets some, some dollars aside for innovation, even if they don't fully know what it's going to fund yet. And if you're just getting started, it's the reason I'm asking this question is that um, one of the, the pitfalls that can happen is if they're kind of core ideas that come in, it's easier to get a sponsor to fund those. But it's, it's harder when you have something a bit more disruptive if you don't have the funding to incubate that. 
Uh, it's something to think about when you're building your team. Do I want to have that capability? Do I want to make that ask? And obviously, there's different resources that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Are you going to? There's different models. There's an outsource model. Do I bring in someone with AI experience to, to prototype that and have a budget? Do I want to build a team of sort of generalist techies that can help me do this in-house? So um, definitely something uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, just really wanted to shift gears because once you've built your team, right, you either have to launch or relaunch. There's a lot that goes into that, right? There's branding. And I think the GM folks showed like a really solid, what Trey did with, with all of the, you know, those late nights, the work, work, work um, on uh, everything they do is branded. You saw that they don't, they don't, I love our solve app. It's part of BI programs, but they said, we're going to brand it tackle, right? Mm -hmm. Like, an, and uh, they could have used, what did they say? The shark tank for mm -hmm. GM accelerate. He's like, no, it's synapse. Right, uh, we're going to have a, a cool name. So there's branding that goes into that. There's mar there's marketing, communications, and then there's the actual launch of your first challenge, your first initiative. So I'm going to pick on you, Derek, because uh, <coughs> we worked together. A couple of things that I noticed yes. were you ran what you call campaigns, probably longer than most people would. I think like almost three months. But then you had this really interesting that I hadn't seen before. This kind of hybrid model with a lot of on-site, face-to-face events and hacks. You want to talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, I wish they were done in three months. <laughs> <laughs> when we started, it's going to last three months. Right, right. <laughs> uh, I think we're now in month five for the last three-month campaign. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we had, uh, we had done s some of this stuff before. As I say, as a technology organization, we were doing this all the time. We tried to formalize it. And we'd had various attempts at that. Um, the old uh, software development challenge, we tried that. I guess that was common in the industry a couple of years ago. It didn't really do anything for us. So as this kicked off, we, um, we tried to address some of the issues there. And what we do now is we work with the sponsor to, uh, to come up with like a a flow here that when we when we do a campaign with one of our verticals, they're on the hook to give a presentation to the whole engineering organization and what it is they do. Uh, what is the what are the key things in that vertical? Where do they make the money? What are the problems? And then another presentation typically a couple of days later on so what's the problem they'd like the engineering team to address and try and solve? So you know, we hold these typically an hour or something like that. So they're on the hook to provide that. Is that what you call the tech talks? And you That's broadcast what that <coughs> webinar to the to It's the, the whole tech talks. Everybody in engineering is invited, and we've got to keep our eye on that because, you know, we use Skype, and Skype has certain limits. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was yeah. one night I was calling the women in India up saying, get them into conference rooms because <laughs> the number of accepts was about to blow the limit of <laughs> Skype, uh, yeah. kind of thing. So, um, <laughs> So we do that, and that's to, to try and get everybody up to the same level of knowledge. What we'd seen earlier was people would say, well, I don't know what they do in transportation, kind of thing. How, how would we know what they're looking for? So we try and do the, uh, the tech talks to get everyone up to a common level of understanding. Uh, when that's done, it then kind of devolves to the local sites. I mean, we're across multiple sites, three sites in, in America, Australia, China, um, and India as well. So it kind of devolves to these sites to do the next stage, which, you know, in many cases is, um, I'll just call it brainstorming. They set up sessions. Uh, we'll maybe cover like a, some of our distinguished engineers or consulting engineers run the sessions where people can just brainstorm around what they saw, what do they think they heard. And this is while you've already taken a bright idea, the optimized challenge, let's say, you've, you've launched it. So the when digital we, ideation is when up. We d when we do the tech talk, when the second tech talk happens where they say, here's what our problem is, we open up the challenge mm. okay. and bright idea. Uh, and then, as I say, it devolves the local sites to do, we just call them engagement activities. Uh, in terms of, uh, I say, tech, not, not the tech talks, the actual brainstorming kind of thing, uh, that we typically try and drag in the experts from the vertical. So whoever did the presentation to us over the tech talk, we'll typically drag them in. Uh, so they'll maybe do it once for us in Irvine, they'll do it for the people in Minnesota as well. So they're on the hook for a couple of times to engage direct with the engineers where they will answer any questions the engineers have in terms of, so what did you really mean when you said that? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. So we go through that phase and they come up with you know, potential ideas. And then what we tend to hold is like a hackathon, 
that had proved uh, very popular. So we basically uh, let them go at it. Uh, I'll say for a day um, was where we started. It's like, okay, take your idea. There's a, there's a day, you know, forget all your meetings and just do this. Yeah. Uh, you know, kick it off in the morning, give them breakfast, feed them at lunchtime, and at the end of the day, they get to present what it was they'd achieved. And that's at multiple sites, potentially, you're doing This, this. is at multiple sites. Uh, it's not synchronized, uh, mm -hmm. but it's multiple sites are doing it. But because it's uh, site-related, it's done differently at multiple sites. So I think in the, the India site, they had so many people doing this, they had to curate it. Mm -hmm. So they got all the suggestions for what people could hack on, then they picked them and said, you know, you guys can go and do that. Uh, I don't have that problem. Okay. <laughs> like, we let them do what they want, uh, kind of thing. But again, it, it changes. So we've done this a couple of times and uh, we used to give them prizes and stuff like that. We started off giving them like monetary awards uh, there were also um, joke awards, shall we say, uh, <laughs> with, with the Heroic Failure Award. Uh, I think we gave them a Betamax video cassette, uh, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, you know, there, there was stuff like that. We, um, we also have a 3D printer. Again, we got a 3D printer for people to play with. And, you know, some of the guys went and made awards in the 3D printer and stuff like that. So again, it's just dragging people in for participation. And what I found in Irvine actually was they decided they didn't actually want the monetary award. Um, it's like, so what do you want, uh, kind of thing. So we adapted. And one time what they wanted was simple, it was t-shirts. So it's like, great, we'll go make t-shirts. And now it's like, yeah, they've got, they participated, they've got a t-shirt, everybody else doesn't, kind of thing. And that was, you know, relatively speaking, simple to do. Um, one of the other things they wanted was, uh, it was like games for the cafeteria. Hmm. Uh, so they, they had used to have a lot of puzzles down there and some other things, so they wanted more games. So, okay. <laughs> we, uh, and, and we used the, the Bright Idea Tale to do that. So, you know, they got feedback from the employees. There were three things on offer. So that was three ideas, and we had the employees vote on the ideas, and that's how they picked the one that hmm. management went and... Uh, and procured for them. What's really interesting about this, and I thought was so cool when we were working together, was I've worked with clients that have hackathons, like standalone events, mm -hmm. or they have a pitch event, or you know, a Shark, Shark Tank style event. They run challenges. You had found a way to t take all these use cases and yes. activities, and also some of the apps and Bright Idea, and and actually stitch them together. Yes. To run a campaign, mm -hmm. right? So, um, do you any of you do that today on the panel? Or is it more, do you use more just to launch a challenge, do the more classic, um, I'm gonna do kind of one challenge, get the ideas, bet them, get them evaluated, approved, and then incubated? So I, not as stitched together as that. I think we've done all oh, of those sounds, pieces. It sounds stitched together. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> it's fabulous. Uh, so I think we've done almost all those pieces, but they don't always go in that sort of, I love that approach, that sort of order. Um, and it, as you were saying that, I was like, oh, we could totally do that. So we've done the sort of hackathons, um, tech talks, but not as specific. So we've done sort of all of these little pieces, but maybe not all around one topic. That's really impactful. Right. I, I it's love interesting that too, because if you think about what you're trying to prove at each point, right? So you're first right. framing the challenge the right, right way, and, the, um, and then you, you get the ideas you can get them evaluated, hack them to make them real and tangible, mm -hmm. and then, okay, well, is it viable as a business? Let's look, think about business model. Let's, if I, let me do a, in this case, you could almost do a, a pitch event, right? Where you say, yes, this is the thing, you can see it, and here's the business we would build around it, or at least some early version of that that you can, you can pitch. And so you also had another interesting thing that you had to move off of a previous system, yes. do a data migration. Yes and then rebrand and relaunch the program. But you can see from the slides that it seems to have worked. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think that's the views is the biggest one, the biggest one there. So mm -hmm. it's all about trying to drive engagement. And, uh, you know, so we're, I think up, was it, I don't know, is it something like six times or something like that? Mm -hmm. We're like about 18,000 views this year versus a couple of thousand last year. Mm -hmm. Now, the, I mean, the program's a year on, so it would have increased naturally, but not by that much. Yeah. So I think that's attributed to some, some of the more integrated approach we're taking, the new tool, which does, you know, it, it fixes some problems we had before in terms of 
you know, like notification of people when they when they someone comments on an idea. A role tool didn't do that. That was a big beef for people. <laughs> How do we know when anything's happened? Mm. But it's a good point, right? Transparency yes. throughout the entire process. Yes. It's something that you overlook often when you start a, a program. Like it, you take it for granted. The number one complaint I think I hear is I don't know what's happening with my mm -hmm. idea. Yes. And it's also transparency. It's great if you get an automated notification, your idea has moved into a stage. But if it just sits there, you still have the same problem. Like the platform can only do so much. Yeah. Um, it's really important that at each, each stage you're being really, really transparent about your idea is or isn't moving forward. Here's why, right? If you want to take another turn at this, because we're talking about a relaunch. If you guys are launching for the first time, um, your first impression, right? If, if I submit an idea and it doesn't go anywhere and I don't get any feedback and they just close it, the next time you launch a challenge, why do I want to participate, right. right? So can you talk a little bit about how you guys have managed that and sort of built belief in your, your employees? Yeah, that was definitely something we were up against. We had portals in the past that it was a great initiative. Somebody was excited about it, but then there was no follow through. So that was something our team committed to is communicating to every single idea submitter. That became a much larger task than we had originally anticipated because we were thinking we were going to get about 100 ideas and we got 350. A great problem to have, but it was really making sure that we had that transparency. Um, we also partnered heavily with our corporate communications team, not only for the launch materials, but also that ongoing communication. So monthly emails saying where the challenge was at. We also, when we moved on to the semifinalist phase, really had great communications acknowledging those winners. And and then getting to the finalist phase, also the same kind of cadence. The other thing that we did for uh, the launch and announcement of our winners, we actually had a live announcement with the CEO and I sitting across from the table from one another and uh, shared that globally with our employees as a live announcement. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about your CEO, and I'm going to transition mm -hmm. us into what CEOs care about, which is tracking impact. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, you start out, there's so many of these considerations. What's my mission and vision? How do I build a team? How do I get this platform up and launched? How do I communicate and market it? And you hit the end of the year, like, what was I supposed to be <laughs> doing? Did I hit my impact numbers? So we like to think about, you know, begin with the end in mind. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you uh, measured impact and made the case that, hey, give me this role yeah. because this is what we did and we can do more of it? Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at impact in our organization, we looked at it from two avenues. Revenue, obviously, our, our focus was new products and services for our organization, so revenue driving initiatives, but also we really wanted to focus on the cultural impact, which when you think about culture, it's intangible it's hard to measure but the tools in the system actually helped us get to the point where we could measure those things so when we look at from an idea standpoint as i mentioned we were hoping for a hundred ideas and we got 350 ideas that is both a revenue and culture metric that we looked at revenue generating obviously the more ideas we get you know, the more impact we can have organizationally, but also just looking at how people were engaging with the system and submitting ideas and feeling empowered to submit those ideas. We also had all of our functions and all major countries that we are have a presence in submit ideas and participate in the process, which was also a really great thing. Our corporate headquarters are in the US, and we really didn't want this to be a corporate initiative where people felt that it was only for people based in our Milwaukee offices. The other piece is we had 40% of our employees engage in the platform. This is through idea views, voting, commenting. And this is a really powerful statistic from the standpoint that 40% of our employees are manufacturing employees who don't necessarily have regular access to a computer. We did see those employees as well participating. So that was a really great impact that we felt that we had. We also, when we looked at our global stats, we had 40% participation or submission participation from the US, 30 from Europe, and 30% from Asia. So a really good spread of ideas from the global group as well. The other piece that we had is we had 
1,800 votes cast in the system. And this was one of the things that I really loved about the platform itself. You could extract data easily and share these results. Mm -hmm. We had 1,800 votes, but then we had 13,000 idea views. And if you think about 5,000 employees in an organization, we almost had a three to one ratio of idea views to employees. Um, we also had almost 700 comments on our ideas. So really a lot of engagement, not only from viewing, but voting and also commenting and collaborating on those ideas. We also had eight countries represented in our semi-finalist group. So with our semi-finalist group, we actually brought those teams to Milwaukee to present to our top 80 leaders in our organization via a trade show. We didn't intentionally select ideas based on their geolog or geographical location, I should say. Rather, it was a happenstance that we just got a really good grouping of ideas from across the globe. The other piece is we had six ideas that we funded for our program. So initially we were targeting two. When we got to our finalist round, our leadership, we could pick the one, two, three, but we said we ultimately wanna fund all of these ideas, which also when you look at the financial impact of two versus six ideas, you know, it's getting us a lot further than we anticipated in year one. The other piece, and I mentioned this earlier, is we had over 100 employees engage in the process from mentors to subject matter experts to people doing IP reviews. And this isn't people who sent one email for their volunteer time. This was people who engaged hours and hours and hours of time. And you know, as a couple of the panelists mentioned too, these volunteers, we had them set for discrete points in the process. People actually asked to stay on as volunteers throughout the program, which is exciting because going into it and asking people to give that time there's a, a bit of hesitancy when you do that because you know that they have normal jobs. And so having those, the people come to you and ask and seeing the wide variety of volunteers we had was really out, outstanding. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> when I work with, with clients, especially the first year, there's this discussion about should we be tracking hard ROI? You know, we're worried because we're not going to be able to show I have a five year product life cycle. How am I going to show revenue, right? So I think. What we see is, I would call these like leading indicators of success, right? And you can start to see the funnel and you can set hard metrics. Like what is the, the percentage that I, I think I should engage in, in the process? How many ideas do we need going through the pipeline to come out with something? When you have the leading indicators of success, then you can start thinking in year two, year three, um, if it, if, or however long your product life cycle is, you can start thinking about, well, what should those lagging indicators of success look like? Are they, um, uh, is it affecting my P&L, those types of things. So um, how many people are measuring impact today in Bright Idea? Okay, we're gonna get those numbers, numbers way up. So um, in the last couple minutes here, I did want to talk about, this is sort of the end of a year, right? Which is great to show these, but then sometimes you can take that and say, okay, are we having the impact we set out to have? Are we still aligned with the mission and the vision that we set out? Has it changed over a year? If we're not having the impact that we think we're having, how can we shift? And Brooke, you just said that you came out of a, a basically a missioning and visioning workshop. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and had an opportunity to really reflect on, you know, how our first year and some change um, with the system was going. And, and not just Bright Idea, but just in innovation in general. And when we really looked at, um, you know, what we were tracking from some of our, our key metrics, though our engagement was, was, was actually moving really towards where we, where we wanted it to be, we weren't quite where we hoped we would be when we think about really those big ideas that will get us to be you know, that billion dollar organization, again, to help us to meet those really important um, mission goals that we've set as an organization and help save lives. And so as we reflected on that, we said, okay, great, we've, we've learned a lot. What do we need to do differently? And so you can see our, our mission statement up here. Uh, the, the biggest thing here is that relentless force. You know, it's like the work, work, work from, from, from GM. What we realized is that, um, you know, we had this opportunity to truly change the way that we are doing business. And, and to do that, we have to be a relentless force. We can't get stuck in some of the things that we were getting stuck in and really be laser focused on what it is that we're trying to accomplish as an organization. And so just to have that time to sit back and really think about A, where we've been, 
what we've learned, and then B, where do we need to go and to refocus ourselves? We've set ourselves up now as we're looking towards you know, the next 18 months, um, some of the things that we need to do differently and how we build on the things that you know, were successful. Um, and it's myself and leadership within you know, the business line. Um, we're now all very aligned on this new mission statement going forward, which sets us up you know, really to be doing great things. Cool. Yeah, and it's sometimes you might might see we've got a lot of ideas, but we haven't seen them get into execution. Mm -hmm. And so you might look at things like, well, we should maybe run some hackathons because we got to make these things real or get people into this kind of maker execution culture. Or it could be, you know, we're not close enough to our customer, and you might be going further upstream, right, with the activity. So, um, and what we kind of skip past a little bit is obviously you guys have had launches, but you've got a, a s sequence of launches. Uh, coming up, right? So you always have this sort of roadmap of challenges to keep executing on. Well, thank you guys. So we've got a few minutes for Q&A and I'm sure it'll spill out. Anybody have questions about what we talked about or anything we didn't cover? So I think I want to follow There's a mic, sorry. Oh, the mic. So I think I want to follow up on what you were just talking about is once you get the idea, how do you follow through with execution? I think you said you had eight different uh, eight groups or from eight different countries that mm -hmm. came in and, and submitted that uh, to your C-level execs. Mm -hmm. where, where did you go from there? So that was at our semi-finalist phase. Oh, semi yeah, so what we did is we ensured that the team or the submitters had were supplied with technical resources and some business resources because many of the submitters didn't come from either an engineering or business background. So in mm -hmm. order for them to build a successful prototype and business case, they needed to be supplied with those resources. But in addition, we gave those teams mentors from a present presentation and coaching standpoint, but also those subject matter experts who had been in, uh, engaged in the idea review process also were uh, supplemented on those teams. So they had this great system or great team that was there to support them through the process. We kept those teams intact from the semi-finalist phase through the finalist phase, and we intentionally picked people who we thought would poten potentially be executing on those ideas as well through launch. I've seen many times in my engineering career, if you hand things off from one individual to another, you often lose steam and momentum. So really intentionally selecting people up front who you think could potentially own it long term was also something. Now it's not always possible to do that, but that was our intent. I would say for us, we've experimented with a couple of different ways. We had a, a hackathon not that long ago. Um, which unfortunately I didn't come up with this name, but it was fantastic. New Kids on the Blockchain. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic. And what they actually did is we did that in two phases and our advanced tech team run that, ran this and they, they had an idea gathering phase, but then they had the actual hack phase where similar to what you were talking about happened in, in your indie office, we, we took the, the, the first set of ideas, voted on them, and then they had, a, they had resources ready to help with building teams around the top four or five to actually try a hack. The other thing we've done is we are just wrapping up that kickbox pilot and we're, we're coaching people not to ask to fund the whole thing, but to fund the next three months of research to say, could, should we keep going with this idea? So they may not be asking for two years of resources and $2 million to build an app. They're asking for $10,000 to do the next phase of research and run a small pilot or whatever it is. And, and trying to get people used to thinking more like a startup, thinking a little bit more like um, going back to a venture kind of group to say, all right, here's the next step and play smaller bets has been a huge impact. And people going, wait, you're asking for how much? Well, yeah, I like the idea. I could give you that to uh, to explore and experiment. As long as you have a clear idea of what you're looking for and how you're going to get there, that's pretty reasonable. And uh, and similarly, finding the right people. Don't pitch it to the CEO. Pitch it to this group that might actually be the ones that own it and may be willing to give ten thousand dollars or whatever it might be to experiment on that next phase to say, is this really good? And then you have an even more compelling case when you come back three months from now. And one ad is to make sure to track it, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's great to have them off doing it, but if you can put them, say, in an incubate pipeline yep. and yep. run those through or, or manage them through if it's a hackathon and you're trying to track where they are, because then you, you, it can become a little bit like the Wild West, which is awesome, people are doing stuff, but if you're accountable for the funds, people might want to know where those ideas are in the pipeline. I think as well there's some uh, luck involved in some of this, because we, we ran a campaign a year or so ago 
we we got something that came out of it. It was great. We did some proof of concept, <clears throat> and then it died in the vine, kind of thing. And it's like, well, okay, we went. The process worked, kind of thing. And then this year it popped back up again, and a customer play actually paid us to do the POC <laughs> on this, <laughs> kind of thing. So it's now back alive again. Yeah, yeah. So you know, sometimes done is not done. <laughs> it's true. You know, the idea is there. It has merit. It'll yeah. take off. I just have a question with um, <coughs> a person from Brady. Um, I actually work for PG&E, and we just completed a challenge with our largest um, line of business, and we ended at 37%. And I just need to, I mean, it's great to get the 40%. I just mm -hmm. want to know how long your ideation was and how long the challenge was, because we literally had to extend our ideation phase for another month to get more people mm -hmm. in there. And plus, when it comes to like, um, users for example views do you guys is it like for unique users do you guys mm. does bright idea because we're not with bright idea at yeah. the moment oh, okay. and i just want to know are they quality views that are calculated in the algorithm so i, just I would need to understand. i'm gonna bring you right out to a rocket scientist outside, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're gonna go all through that and we'll get it so you can ask a bunch of different questions about okay. how you can report it my question That's okay. is like how long your ideation phase was and your review. Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk you through our timeline uh, on a high level. So we launched our communications on August 1st of last year. That was in conjunction with our fiscal kickoff. We opened up the portal for submissions right after Labor Day. So we left it open. So early September to early December, we left the portal open and then we spent time from December through about February evaluating and we were evaluating the ideas obviously throughout the process but really the scoring we did detailed IP reviews on the ideas as well and then selected the ideas for the semi-finalist phase in mid-February so mid-February we got to our top 12 ideas from 350 after the top 12, those teams presented at our leadership summit So they had in mid-April, so they had a couple of months to put together proof of concept, business case. Right after that summit, we selected the top six finalists. They then were given more time till August 8th, so essentially a full year cycle, and that's when they did their finalist pitch event. Within that time frame, they actually went out to customers, built on top of their proof of concepts, and modified and honed in their business cases a bit more so a full year cycle but from the ideas or the idea portal being open was about september to december okay yeah and um we tried it for two months and now we're trying to do four months. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes more sense to have it because now we're doing the business cases there, and we got 357 ideas. Yeah. There's one, one cautionary tale is that deadlines spur action. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I was part of a team where we ran a three month pilot and we got 51% of the ideas the last day and a half. Yeah, yep. yeah that's what we, we So we sometimes actually, extending yeah. it doesn't mean you're going to get more without all of the best practices around driving engagement, yep. communications, marketing. So, and the problem with that is half the ideas or 49%, 48% had lots of collaboration, voting, et cetera, on them. The other 52% had nothing. We, right. you know, there was no time. So we actually had to extend the collaboration period and shut off. Uh, submission so that people would do it, but then it's people thought that the challenge is over. So there's it's more a lot of this is really about um, best practices around really driving engagement, and getting people in. We saw a steady state. Um, we saw an uptick at the beginning, an uptick at the end, but in general, it was actually pretty surprising. We thought we were going to see a dip and then a rise, and we had pretty steady submission yeah that's the same that's the same way we had like a steady <laughs> we sound like we have very similar <laughs> statistics we should definitely talk after this well we have an interesting <laughs> work group but uh, you guys yeah. stay a couple Thank more you. minutes to answer some questions mm -hmm. no. i know it's it's technically i think we're hitting break time but we can stay up here and take yeah, a quick more. one to many of you have operations globally so do you launch challenges in other countries in local languages or you <laughs> primarily do it in english only Ours is English only. Ours was global, and we actually used the Google Translate widget from Bright Idea. 
it was actually interesting because we were concerned that the translations wouldn't be uh, great. And they, <laughs> this Bread Idea team shared data with us how Google Translate had improved their uh, was a machine translation or uh, neural yeah, machine yeah. translation um, and how the translations were actually really great. And I, mm -hmm. I followed up and did a bit of research on it on my own and it looked great. The only language that was the exception was Chinese. So what we did is we had a separate um, submission for China where then when those ideas came in we had translators on hand that would modify the submission before it went in so it would translate properly. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, we identified early on to support that culture and foster that culture of innovation. We had to acknowledge, document, and celebrate the success we we're achieving. Um, we are very limited because we're a state agency on providing anything that's incentivized. We can't mm. do anything monetary, any type of shirts. Mm -hmm. um, we do have programs where if it achieves a specific or threshold of efficiency, they can apply for like a merit or superior mm. accomplishment award. Um, outside of incentivized um, success celebrations, what do you guys do for your staff, for your... It's interesting, we've uh, just finished up, not finished up, but we're in the midst of finishing our kickbox pilot. And it is amazing how many of them simply being able to raise their idea and present it to somebody who might actually be able to do something about it ha is, is a reward in and of itself. Now, we want to do what we can to further recognize them and keep driving the behaviors that, that really you know, lead to the outcomes we're looking for. But it's amazing just engaging in and of itself, having the freedom to engage has been a reward for most people. Yeah, I, I would agree. We, we don't have a big budget for you know, monetary awards either. Um, we, we also built in using leadership to call out folks who had you know, submitted ideas and just being recognized by leadership that otherwise would likely not have the opportunity to interact with them was something that we got some really good feedback on. And this is going to sound silly, but stickers. Um, when we launched our first challenge, I mailed people these stickers as sort of like a surprise and delight because I had budget for them. Um, and uh, uh, with a handwritten thank you note just for submitting your idea and being part of our very first challenge and I got a lot of really great feedback you know people like I don't ever get mail this was great I put the <laughs> sticker on my computer you know so sometimes just something really little to um, you know goes a long way electronic badges yeah, electric, yeah we're, we're, we're testing that right now externally some of the electronic badging system so that's actually something we spoke with one of the scientists about and mm. we're interested in, in looking at their um, their IS service mm -hmm. for building that out for us. So we've had it on a previous platform and it, it really drove activity and participation. Oh, yeah, and to build on that, you know, something we haven't done yet, but we're um, testing will be a, something you could add to your LinkedIn profile that mm. says that you are, you know, we have to figure out exactly what it will say, but sort of building on that similar idea. Thank you guys, and just wanted to point out, um, you see these two uh, cool banks, these are custom crafted wooden um, rocket ship oh. piggy banks. We're gonna be randomly selecting people who join the channels up here today and giving them out at the end of the day, pretty cool. cool. Handcrafted by someone in my home state of Utah, apparently. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, well, yeah, right? Fancy. One um, and if you'd like to, uh, if, if you don't want to have to go to those channels and you want um, us to add you, there's a sign-up sheet up here. So thank you very much for hanging in there with us. Thank you, panel. It was really great, informative, and uh, I'm sure we can continue the Q&A out in the hallway. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>